Madam President, to repeat the presidential words, at which point I'll then call for the students. Mr. Associate Dean, will you present them in the presence of the faculty and in witness of the college in order that they may complete their matriculation by signing the college register? I will indeed, and now I'll happily invite each of the students whose names I call to come forward. I'll stop spots with President Dame Leitner. Please just come forward, shake my hand, shake the hand of President Dame Leitner, and then if you would, sign the college registration book. Naturally, not everyone part of the cohort is here this afternoon. It's just the way of the world. Um, but we welcome those who are not here, get spirit, and we'll have another opportunity for those who are not here this afternoon to sign the college uh, registration book formally at the spring convening weekend, so there will be another opportunity to so do. So without any further ado, I'll swap spots with you and call the following students forward. Sachi Ujmera, hometown of Carrier, Mississippi? Carrier. Carrier, Mississippi. Tim Arnave, Arlington, Virginia. Ellen Bukowski, Falls Church, Virginia. Michael Blaney, Chevy Chase, Maryland. Lola Bondar. Woodside, California. CEC Charles Chapin, Roanoke, Virginia. Peter Dog, Amsville, Virginia. Gordon Fowler, Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Ethan Garofalo, Londonderry, New Hampshire. Okay, this is a big future. And of course, I'm going to do that. I don't know what would happen here. Great, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. James Hollinser, Stevensville, Maryland. Gary Martin, Brooklyn, New York. Barbara McNiff, Broad Run, Virginia. Ashe Modi, Miami, Florida. Harvey Morell, Timonium, Maryland. Sue Murray, Potomac. Tyler O'Keefe, Fraber, Maine. Jordan Bedford, Brunswick, excuse me, Jordan Park, Bedford, New Hampshire. Allie Strachan, Brunswick, Maine. Hi, Allie. Thanks so much. I know you're right. Anyway, we're close. Strachan. Strachan. Let me say it again. <laughs> Allie Strachan, <laughs> Brunswick, Maine. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, John Wright, Merrimack, New Hampshire. This official
officially ends the signing portion of the convocation. I'll ask President Dean Leitner to take her seat once more and endure my, my brief remarks. I promise we can brief. This is my second convocation address. In my first convocation address, I tried to say something about one of the great joys of being a tutor, the joy that comes with rereading the texts of the program. The texts in the program are so difficult, so manifold, so dialectical in their wisdom and their structure that howsoever deeply and closely one reads the first time round, there will invariably be a nearly inexhaustible treasure of riches left untouched. And whereas students do not, save in, let us say, certain unhappy circumstances, have the chance to return and take a class again, <laughs> tutors are afforded that gift. And I am proud to be part of the faculty that really does think of this opportunity as a gift. The gift of being able to return to the works that make up our program year in and year out. But in that address, I tried to suggest that sometimes our, or perhaps I should be more restrictive here and say merely my, my understanding of what happens in such rereadings often goes wrong. I suggested that too often we think of a picture of rereading as cumulative, as if each and every encounter were a chance to add to one's understanding of a work. First, one has grasped this bit, then one has grasped that bit, then one grasps how this bit and that bit hang together. There is, it is true, no suggestion that a sufficient number of rereadings will reveal how the, will reveal the work in its entirety, but I do think that we talk about rereading as, in some sense, there being an asymptotic accumulation of different bits which will contribute to something like a full understanding of the whole. And in that first address, I didn't want to deny the truth of that picture in some broad sense, but I did want to suggest that it was importantly incomplete. It was incomplete, I tried to say, because there was some other totally non-cumulative way in which rereading could proceed. I didn't quite have a word for this, but I felt that there were moments in my own rereading in which the next reading did not add to what had come before. It did something totally different to whatever had happened before, something that cannot be arithmetically captured by the addition of some new bit to some already existing set of bits. But one thing I emphatically did not do in the writing of that convocation address was consult with any others, neither students nor faculty. And I don't think I realized this until midway through the recently completed semester when I found myself in conversation with a colleague about some third colleague's remark in a faculty meeting. That third colleague had remarked that some years prior, he, while teaching freshman seminar, was very worried about his seminar because after several meetings on Plato's Dialogue the Republic, the seminar had not yet talked about the forms. And this colleague worried that he was not discharging his responsibility, his duty as a tutor, if, as was the case, the seminar could have gone several meetings without any mention of the forms, any mention of Plato's allegedly two-world metaphysics. Was he not somehow derelict in his duty as a tutor? Now, I, I think that this third colleague about whom I was having a conversation with another did in fact come to see that he was not remiss in not having steered the conversation 
in the direction of the forms, in the direction of Plato's allegedly two-world metaphysics. And the reason that this third colleague gave for why he did not steer the conversation in that direction were all very good ones. Tutors are not supposed to be steerers. Tutors are supposed to be fellow participants in conversation. They are not supposed to set the agenda for a conversation, let alone for a book. Students can and must follow their own questions. And if those questions do not involve Plato's allegedly two-world metaphysics, whatever that phrase may mean, then so be it. But to return to the conversation I was having with another colleague about this third colleague, the third colleague who had been in freshman seminar about the Republic, this conversation with my fellow, whom I'm happy to say was tutor Matt Link, revealed to me yet another, and I think still more beautiful reason to think that this third colleague was not wrong to have allowed the conversation to go where it will. The forms, or mention thereof, be damned. My colleague Matt said to me, quote, inside any great book, there is an infinite number of other books, books that are themselves coherent wholes. And so even when we think that we have, quote, the right gestalt, the basic guideposts marked out, a sense of the fundamental questions of any one book, it does not mean that there aren't still other books within that same books, within that same book, books with different guideposts and different fundamental questions, all waiting to be discovered. And so one way of thinking about what was happening in that freshman seminar that didn't talk about the forms was that that seminar was discovering a book, coherent and whole, but yet undiscovered, within the Republic. I thought that this was all beautifully said, but I realized that it was a much better version of what I was trying to say myself in my first address, that rereading ought not necessarily be thought of as cumulative or arithmetic. For what that cumulative or arithmetic reading rules out is the possibility that the gestalt we already have, the basic guideposts, the fundamental questions, is the only one. And it's not. There is, as this colleague, Matt Link, came to show me, an infinite number of books within the book. And it is only by being open to the book, and to the books within the book, that we ever inhabit them in a way proper to a liberal education. I was so happy to be party to this conversation with my colleague Matt, but also a bit disappointed in myself. As I said, this, what Matt reported to me, was exactly what I was trying to say, and I realized how poorly I had said it in my own first address. And part perhaps most of the reason why, I, why, so I came to see, I had said it so poorly is because I hadn't first talked about it with any others. It was, as I had said, simply something that I had written by myself, without consultation, without conversation from students or fellow colleagues. And that was just the problem. The statement of the program of St. John's College begins by describing the college as a, quote, community of learning. We are not, in the first instance, an academic program, an institution, or even a school. We are, first and foremost, a community. And that means that we learn with and from one another. And if we learn with and from one another, we ought to write with and from one another. And so, instead of sitting and writing such an address by myself, I ought to have treated this undertaking undertaking the writing of the convocation address in the spirit of community. Had I done so, I would have done better than the crude suggestion that I offered in that first address that cumulative rereading was somehow not the entire story. I would have written something more insightful, more helpful, more nourishing, and perhaps more lasting. 
And so let that be my encouragement to you today as you join this community, that you never forget that it is a community that you are joining and that all of our intellectual endeavors, our speaking and our writing both, go best when done together. There will, of course, always be a place for private study. But I think you will never be part of a community as vibrant as this. And so I encourage you to lose yourself in this community. I promise in my own work as associate dean to set an example, as best I can, of what it looks like to lead one's intellectual, intellectual life fully in community. And I ask you to call me to account when I'm not doing so. Giving an account, however, of my own failures in my first address is, I'd like to think, a beginning of recommitting myself in all of my intellectual endeavors to doing so in and through community. But I recognize it's only the beginning. With that said, I officially convene the spring semester of the Graduate Institute by saying the following words, Conval Cotum Est. Welcome to the Graduate Institute, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, President Dean Leitner. Thank you to our registrar. And I invite you to introduce yourself to one another, to mill around, and to you know, clear your mind.